Hey, it's Doug with an opportunity to catch up with the incomparable, the always funny, very entertaining, adjectives are free, Mark Lowry joins us. How are you, my friend? It is so good to see you on this beautiful day. It is so beautiful here in Houston, Texas, where I'm from, and we don't have very many pretty days, you know. So are you familiar I, with Houston? I've been through it, through the airport. Well, I was born here, and it is the most humid place on earth. Really, I'm telling you, you have to be born here to love it. So I was born here. My parents were born here. My grandfather could remember when Houston had one stoplight. Oh, wow. And and uh, so it's so humid down there and down here. The Pentecostals won't lift their arms. That's all you can get out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Never let them see a sweat, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about you coming to where I'm at in Nashville, Tennessee, to the Fisher Center on March the 3rd, a night with Mark Lowry and friends. Oh, Tell us about gonna, that. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be so much fun. <clears throat> Chaz Corzine, who's a friend of mine who's now running that building, he wanted me to come by and see it. And it is spectacular. I I don't know if you've been there yet. Just the but, photos, but it looks amazing. Oh, it's amazing. So... I went through there and, and he said, why don't you do a concert here? So I said, OK. And so I'm bringing my friends. I'm sort of like uh, Bill Gaither light because I'm bringing the Martins. I'm bringing the sisters. And if you're not familiar with the sisters, Google the sisters gospel group and you'll meet three sisters that are unbelievable. And then let's see, Jaron Davis will be there with a complete mass choir which will be fun. And Stan Whitmire, my accompanist, and it'll be a night, you know, I know every night what the first song will be and what the last song will be, but it's an ADHD rabbit trail getting to it. And it is so much fun. It's fun for me because I don't have to think ahead. Mm. I don't have to plan ahead. I just get up and talk about whatever's going on. And if I can't think of anything going on, I'll pull out some old story from my file in my brain and we'll run down memory lane. It is a, it, I just loved it. I love the concerts now that I'm, I'm going to be 65 this year. Wow. And people are still coming out to see me. I mean, you still got, I got to go. That's you cool. know, God called me to do this in college and he didn't ever, he, you know, I've tried to retire, retire, retire. I've tried to retire twice. One of the most real recently. And it's not that he won't let me. It's that he knows I'll get bored. Mm. I'll get bored and I'll think of something new I want to talk about. And then I'm off and running again. So I don't guess there'll ever be any retirement as long as people are coming out. Well, we're certainly looking forward to it March 3rd at the Fisher Center. Is that what keeps it sort of uh, fresh and exciting for all the years you've been doing it is knowing that there's not really a game plan just to start and a finish? Well, I, yeah, maybe, because I used to have programs. I'd write out a program. I'd get out there, and after the first song, I never looked at it again. I was just go off and running. And I thought, why am I going to all the trouble of worrying about a program? I still worry about it, but I always talk. I worry the Lord about it. You know, I worry him about it. I say, now, don't you let me down. You know, like he's going to. Has he ever? You right, know, right. but I still have that that I don't know what it is that, oh gosh, I gotta, I gotta sing tonight. You know, I only have to do it now about 30 times a year. You know, it's not like my schedule's like it used to be. I mean, when I first started, I was doing 200 concerts a year. Wow. But I was, wow. you know, I was 22. So, uh, you know, it was fun, but <clears throat> now I'm 30, I'm, I'm 30 concerts, 65. So it, the nerves have not let up. In fact, I think they're getting worse. Really? Yeah. Because I'm thinking, you know, okay, the brain's older now. Can it keep up? Um, you know, I mean, there's just, a, you got a lot to worry about. But I tell you this, I wouldn't be any other age. I wouldn't go back for nothing, even though I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But I look back over 65 years of stories and life happenings. I mean, I've I've even learned to tell myself when I'm headed face first into Shepherd Drive without a helmet on my motorcycle to stay awake. You don't want to miss this because I know a story's coming out of it. I know there are going to be diamonds. When I finally wake up on Shepherd Drive, there are going to be diamonds everywhere. 
because the Lord always places diamonds in the middle of your tragedies. That's his business. That's he's really good at it. And if you look around, I mean, you don't have to go anywhere. You're already sitting in the middle of it. I was already on Shepherd Drive. I didn't go unconscious. I shattered my leg, but I was conscious. And I took notes on that entire event. And yeah. I may tell that story March 3rd. Uh, you know, the whole the whole story. It is one of the funniest stories I've ever told. And it's true. None of my stories have ever been made up because um, I don't know how. But I do know how to pay attention when I'm headed into face first into shepherd drive, I've learned don't go unconscious. You do not want to miss this. And there were so many things that happened between shepherd drive and the hospital okay. that I would have missed had I been unconscious. And they're all part of that story. So, you know, life to me is just taking notes, you know, number one, don't take too much interest in it. Pretend you're watching a movie how bored would you be if you paid top dollar for a movie and there was no drama in it? Mm, mm. Want your money back. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to get to heaven and say, could I have my money back? My life was too easy. Be thankful that the Lord is taking you through hard times because that's where he's conforming you into the image of his son. And one day you'll be just like Jesus, 33 and Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking you know, about I did the, you know, I did the 23 and me. Have you oh, done yeah. that? I did. I am, a, I am 11% Jewish and we never knew it. My daddy was 20 something percent. My grandfather, I think my great grandfather must have been running from Hitler and changed our name. <laughs> you know, that's the only thing I can figure out. Wow. wow. But I was thrilled. I tell everybody that's 11% Jesus in me. <laughs> you know, that's he good. was. He was Jewish, but I'm kidding about that. You know, I'm serious about the Jewish, but of course the 11% Jesus in me, I got a hundred percent Jesus in me, you know, and he's in all of us. Amen. He is in all of us who know him. And I think he might even be in all of us who don't know him because it's called a conscience and we just got to let everybody know his name. Your conscience has a name and his name is Jesus. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's I could good. be wrong. I'm a recovering fundamentalist. We're all a work in progress, right? Yeah. Mark, but I always preface is... everything with I could be wrong. You better check me out. Um, a lot of folks following you on YouTube uh, just whenever you choose to broadcast, right? Right. During uh, really right before the pandemic, uh, I call it the plague, right before the plague. We, uh, I was going live because I could, you know, Facebook lets you go live free. YouTube lets you go live free. Twitter has a, your Twitter account can have. So I found a way to broadcast to all three streams at the same time from my little studio I've created. And it's called Just Whenever because I go live just whenever I feel like it. And usually when I'm home, I go live about one time a day. Oh, sorry about that. I go live about one time a day. When, when I'm home, when I'm on the road, I don't bother with it. But but when I'm home, I just walk in here, hit a few buttons. We're live. We sing the old hymns. I'm, you know, I'm 65 this year in June, and I grew up on Amazing Grace, Blessed Assurance, Love Lifted Me. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And all those old songs that I know by heart, you know, I don't have to memorize them. But I put up the words for those who don't have a good memory like mine, and they're real big, so all the old people that follow me can read along and sing along, and there'll be a thousand people watching every time I go live because they get notified. They they hit the notification button. They I've taught them how to do that, and wherever they are, they stop and come join me. That's cool. Yeah, it's That's so cool. much fun that at this age I can sit right here and reach more people than I will reach at the Fisher Center. I'll reach more people than I could reach if I went live. If I went on road on the road 365 days, it would take me 10 years to reach as many people as I reach here in a week. Was it hard for you during the the plague to no, not be able it. to be out on the road? Or was yeah. this that was the film? Yeah. Gerald Gerald Wolf of a Southern Gospel group called um Hold on. Wait, this is what happens when you turn 65. You forget people you know real well. Joe, 
Greater Sound. Have you ever heard of them? Anyway, yes. well, he told me you're going to hate it because I was, see, I took a year off before the plague. I took that off as just a, a, a sabbatical, okay. not knowing the plague was coming. So at the end of that year, the plague hit. And I hate to say this, but I thought, oh, great. I get another year off, you know, which it turned out to be at least that. And I didn't miss it one day because I would come in here and I would talk to the people and I would sing to them and I would encourage them. And we'd talk about Jesus we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about things that don't matter. We talk about the kingdom of God and where we're headed and the blood that has trans deemed, redeemed us and trans whatever the trans word is. He has done it. And we just, nothing controversial happens here. On my Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, it is not a democracy. It is a dictatorship. And I am the dictator. One cross word and you're blocked. I mean, just I, anything negative. I mean, I just don't want to hear it. Leave that for CNN, Fox, and all those other people. Don't bring it here. This is all about Jesus. And if you don't want to be all about him on my page, then bye. There's so many other pages you can go to. Don't come over here and pick a fight. That's Ooh, true. That's an, I didn't mean to run down that rabbit trail. But anyway, that's what I do. It's so much fun. Well, talk a little bit about, um, I'm curious, I know there's a myriad of stories, but um, is there a story that comes to mind of someone that came up to you after a concert and just, you you, you hit them between the eyes, you brought them joy when they had no joy, you brought conviction, I mean, oh, some of the been, feedback. So many, you know, through the years, the most, the one I've heard the most is you helped me raise my hyperactive child, you know, and and because I admitted, you know, and all, my whole career is built on the fact that I have ADHD. But, you know, it started for me. The Lord called me into the music ministry. And those were the best I could understand. Those were his words. It wasn't audible. It was much louder than that. Mm -hmm. It was in my spirit. He called me. I, I could walk you through that whole experience. But but I knew what I was to do. Well, when I started going to these churches, independent fundamental Baptist churches that I come from, I had to do something while the little old man in the back of the church would change the soundtracks. So I started talking, introducing the next song. Well, I'd tell a story from my life that and I know, my gosh, they're paying attention when I talk. They're not counting ceiling tiles when I talk. They're sitting up straight. They're laughing in this independent Baptist church. And I thought, okay, I better dance with who brought me. All I cared about is communicating. I want to convince the world. The hub of everything I do is to convince people a man rose from the dead. That's the bottom line. Songwriting, humor, Bill Gaither's, all of that comes off of that hub. And anything that doesn't match up to that hub, as far as my career is concerned, I'd have no interest in. Mm -hmm. So I would do that and they would laugh. And I thought, okay, then I'd tell them more about my life and they'd laugh harder. And then they'd say, oh, I've got an ADHD kid. You know what I mean? The yeah, more yeah. you show your scars, the mo more they'll share theirs is what I've learned. And uh, so I just started going with it, you know? And talking to people like I'm sitting on the back porch with my best friend, but I'm the only one talking, which is my favorite way to have a conversation anyway, if you can't tell. That's good. So was it a hard transition when you was, I mean, there was, were you always singing and telling jokes or was always. there a time? Okay. Always. So, so it's never been just this. It's never been just. No. Uh -uh. I would never have lasted for me or them. If I get up and sang five songs in a row, everybody in that room would be in a coma. I am I am well aware of my audience. I mean, that's why I leave the house lights up. I never have the house lights down in my shows. I learned that in church. Mm -hmm. I want to see them. I want to look at everybody in the eyes before the night's over. I walk out in the audience for most of the night. I, I don't like being on the stage away from the people because mm -hmm. I trained on the floor of all those Baptist churches with my PA system on the Lord's Supper table. When I finally gave up on the little old man in the back of the church, I ran it myself from the Lord's Supper table, my cassette deck and a foot switch for reverb when I'm singing and turn it off when I'm not singing. Okay. And I did everything from the floor. 
I was never on the platform. So it's when I joined the Gaithers and I'm on the platform and the audience is blacked out like it's Broadway, I had to relearn everything. I had to learn to listen to the audience rather than see them. In fact, I got a horrible story about that. Early on when I was with the Gaithers, before Bill started interrupting me and we created our banter, he would have me do monologues. And I was telling one one night about my wreck that I had when I was in college. I uh, broke 11 bones. It's it's called Pivot on Your Good Foot. I think it's on YouTube. But anyway, um, I was telling this story and someone from the audience that I could not see said, your face is going to stick like that. And I ignored it because I thought, okay, I'll just ignore it. Maybe it won't happen again. A few minutes later, your face is going to stick like that. And everybody started laughing around this person. I couldn't see any of them. The spotlights were in my face. The audience was in darkness. And then I heard it again and more people were laughing. And I thought, okay, I'm being heckled at a Gaither concert. These people don't throw, you know, oranges. They, you know, they might throw a bran muffin. These are old people. They don't heckle. But this person was heckling me. And finally, without seeing who I was talking to, I said, I picked a, a, a line I used when I worked, when I used to work in public high school assemblies. When kids would heckle me, I used a bunch of lines I'd never used to old people, you know, because those kids that heckle you, they want attention. You give them the attention. They get excited. They bring all their friends to the Friday night pizza blast and they all get saved. So that's the way that worked. That's the only time I'd ever been heckled. So I'm at the Gaither Show and Family Fest, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, 6,000 people there. And several hundred now were laughing every time this person said, your face is going to stick like that. And I finally said, yeah, and I pointed at him. That's what happens to you when your mother takes drugs while she's pregnant. <laughs> well, high schoolers loved it. I've never felt air pressure change in an auditorium before. Wow. They sucked air. They were horrified. I felt a filling loosen in my back tooth. The air pressure changed so much. And that one lonely drop of sweat that falls down your back when you're bombing and lands in your underwear. And I'm thinking, what did I do? What did I do? And I finished the monologue, sit down and I finish it to crickets. I might add. I sit down next to Michael English, who is the co color of white paper. And I said, what happened? And he leaned forward and said, he's in a wheelchair. Wow. If there's ever a time in my life I wanted the earth to open up and swallow me, you're, that's what happens to you when your mother takes drugs while she's pregnant. And the audience thought I could see him. Mm. Mm. Oh, I couldn't find him quick enough after that concert and apologize and explain it. And he loved it. He he was a big fan, had been forever, loved the attention, loved, get, you know, he loved it. But the people and the thought that anybody would think that I would hurt someone like that. I'd rather be dead than hurt someone like that. And that's the truth. I don't want to hurt people, especially uh, people that are le less well than I am. No. Anyway, wow. that was a story. You might edit that out. That's, not, that's a good one, ain't it? What? Well, what's your go-to heckle line now? Or you don't get heckled anymore. I don't get heckled. And if I do, I just, yeah, I can see them. Oh, I'll tell you what I learned from that. If you want to know the lesson I learned. Yeah. Number one, Bill Gaither never brought it up. Number one, he knew I got it. He didn't have to sit, take me aside and say, you know, you goofed, didn't you? There was no, if you didn't know, then you don't need to be on that stage. Right? Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, never talk to anyone you can't see. Mm. Don't talk to them. Put a spotlight on them. But if you can't see them, ignore them. I don't care what they do. Don't talk to them if you can't see them. Just because you hear them doesn't mean you got all the information. Mm, that's good. And what else did I learned that just don't, you know, respond kindlier to old people, you know, <laughs> since that's my crowd now. Well, we are coming up on the Super Bowl this weekend. Uh, are you a football fan? Do you have a dog in the hunt, or is that no, just I don't. I, I, I'm not really a football fan unless somebody from Texas is playing, and then they have to tell me who it is, and then I get all excited. But I figured a long time ago, they're not following my career. Why should I follow theirs?
<laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Kind of an open-ended question, but how important is laughter? Oh my goodness. Can you imagine life without it? I love it. I love how it clears my lungs. I love how it you, you can't not breathe and laugh. You know, it's impossible. And I think it's just something that you can't you can't force. You can't manipulate. You can't. The best laughter for me is is the surprise laughter, like a joke. And I never figured out the ending and I never saw it coming. Oh, I love those. Or a, a story where you never saw that coming, you know, just surprises. I love that kind of humor. Let's see. And of course, the scriptures say a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Uh, and I think our father, who is the healthiest father of all fathers, loves to laugh. He must. I mean, Jesus had to have laughed. He hung around 12 guys. You know, they sat around campfires, eating beans and telling stories that were never put in the scriptures. And um, and I don't think he, I mean, sinners loved him. He had to be in for a good time. And I mean that in a holy good time. I don't think that sinners felt, oh, we can't hang around him. He'll, he'll look down on us because, uh-uh. no, they felt welcome. So, I think laughter is very important. Uh, at least it is for my life and my career, especially. So you mentioned something about uh, retiring twice. So that's not really on your radar. It's just kind of one year at a time, one month at a time. Yeah, I may take uh, 24 off. I may take a year off here and there mm -hmm. just because I can. Why not? Yeah. yeah. And I'll go live. You know, nobody's going, if you need to see me, I'll be right here. Right in front of that just whenever sign. And we'll ex continue to explore life and stories. I mean, wouldn't it be great to just sit here, tell the same stories, but then when I'm done, go to my lazy boy in the other room and uh, watch my programs. Pretty good. Or as, as my grandmother used to say, I need to go watch my stories. Oh, I don't have any stories, but I do like watching TV. 